Welcome to Smart Talk, where we speak with leading academics and other thoughtful persons on the important challenges facing the world today. My name is Edward Dodson. I am a longtime member of the faculty of the Henry George School of Social Science. Today, we have the pleasure of once again speaking with Fred Harrison, research director of the London-based Land Research Trust and author of some dozen books, numerous articles and documentary films analyzing the causes of humanity's most serious social, political, and economic problems. Strongly influenced by the teachings of Henry George and other political economists of the 18th and 19th centuries, Fred has devoted nearly five decades to the growing challenge of stimulating momentum for systemic changes, not only in the United Kingdom, but in many other countries, most notably in Russia during the decade following the collapse of the Soviet Union. The fact that his efforts and those of many others with whom he has worked tirelessly have so far failed to change the course of history has caused him to think critically of the reasons. He gradually came to the conclusion that a serious obstacle to real progress is how arguments for systemic change are framed. He has gone back to the drawing board after sometimes studying human biology and human societal evolution to identify the factors that lead to successful communities. Today, we will discuss with him the content of his latest work, a trilogy titled Hashtag We Are Rent, the first book of which is now available. Fred, welcome back to Smart Talk. Good to have you. Good afternoon, Ed. So, uh, where should we begin this discussion? Uh, I you know, I reading your book took me back many years to when I first met you and started to read uh, your your articles that were published in Land and Liberty, where you were the editor for many years. Uh, I think it'd be great for everyone to hear sort of the evolution of your thinking, how you came to where you are today, and why you think your latest project has a the potential for momentum uh, or momentous uh, accomplishment. What do you think? Well, I bought into the language that existed in the 19th century, which was carried over into the 20th century, about the need to rearrange the revenue systems of government in favor of the principles of efficiency and fairness, which sounded reasonable to me. And so I became an advocate of fiscal reform the need to shift the tax burden off the people who worked, who created the nation's wealth, and onto the rents of land, which is the net income, which uh, our old uh, friend, Professor Mason Gaffney, described as the net income. It was the additional revenue that people helped to produce that they invested in public infrastructure and to fund public services. So the idea of a land value tax seemed eminently reasonable and I ran with it for decades until, as you say, uh, we tried it out uh, in Russia for 10 years and you were one of the guys who came over to Moscow to help and we failed. It seemed like we were so close, didn't it? It should have happened because all of the rent yielding natural resources were in the public domain already in 1990. And all that the government of Boris Yeltsin had to do was to liberate uh, the uh, enterprises, to privatize them, to enable people to pursue profit as well as the highest wages they could earn. And they would have created something resembling a perfect market economy. But that's when things went wrong, not least because agencies from Europe and North America intruded and pushed the idea of privatizing everything, especially, of course, the natural assets that yielded the rent. And we ended up with the oligarchs. So as a result of that experience, I realized that we were onto a hiding for nothing. And we had to change strategy if something uh, was to be achieved. And so I began a well, it's been two decades of reflection, 
to the point where I now realized that the language we were using was self-defeating. It was not accurate, actually, but also by tying it into the notion of a tax, we turned people off automatically before the conversation began. They didn't want another tax. And I have to admit that I sympathize with that view. So we needed new language to reposition the argument that we have to restructure the social system in on terms that would render it sustainable. And that's the uh, narrative that I'm beginning to unfold in the book called Hashtag We Are Rent. Well, this is a, a major undertaking to get people to change their thinking about how societies ought to be organized. It's certainly what we've run up against, not just you and I, but but hundreds of other people who've joined in this campaign ever since Henry George. Uh, and for some reason, it's very difficult to get people to understand what is in their best interest, not just as individuals, but as communities and soci societies. In your research, you know, did you uncover or come to any conclusion of why people find so difficult an understanding of what you and I think is common sense? Well, people like you and I stumbled on the essence of what was meant by the notion that the rent of land ought to be in the public domain. But we did so by accident and not so much by being taught the big picture. We understood clearly the economics of it, that's what is taught, but left unsaid were all the ramifications, the social implications, the moral consequences, the big picture which needs to be made explicit. So the reason why people find it difficult to grasp what we implicitly understand is that they've been deprived of the big picture and that was deliberate. The language that we inherited since uh, the enlightenment of the 18th century has been so impoverished that people are not allowed the benefit of thinking in terms of the richness of what it means to be human beings. Uh, the language was impoverished so that we end up thinking in ways that serve the purposes of the rent seekers. So with the word tax, for instance, uh, we turn people off by talking about well, all we want is to introduce a land value tax. Oh no, thank you, but we don't like taxes. They back away, their minds close down. Uh, so we, most people, have been co-opted into this culture of rent seeking. And so we can't think outside the box. We're not allowed to. The language prevents us from doing so. And so it becomes a linguistic challenge. We can't make the breakthrough until we construct the alternative language that opens up people's minds. And this won't be something new to them. It will be the retrieval of what people through evolutionary timescales already understood. So it's renewing our sense of that evolutionary history that becomes the primary objective of any attempt at uh, cracking the problems of the modern age. Well, Fred, I've been teaching political economy at the Henry George School and at other locations now for, it's hard to believe, almost 40 years. And what it, what's really been difficult for me to grasp is I've had a captured audience every year. I've sometimes had people study with me for an entire year. Um, and we're not just teaching land value taxation. That's a public policy that, that is brought into the discussion, but we're teaching fundamentals of how societies ought to be organized, what's justice and what isn't. People attend the courses, they think, they read, and yet, uh, where do they go? 
they disappear and we never hear from them again. They go back into their, their everyday lives, but very few people, even after a year of study with, with us, a, even longer, I have, I have now students who have been taking courses with me at the two universities that I teach in uh, for seven or eight or nine years. And they still have a difficult time grasping what you're talking about. And that is the essence of the relationship of rent to well-being. Uh, and I, I struggle with how to get people to really think deeper about it. You, I mean, you're providing the raw material. How do we then get people to begin to think deeply about it? First, read the trilogy. And then uh, the next step is to be willing to take some action. I, those are the challenges I think we face uh, in trying to change the course of history. We do. And uh, I can't claim to have uh, answers of a rational kind to the problems that you've spelt out. Because as I say, all those students in the end are told almost daily, they've got to get on the housing ladder, not in order to have a home, but to gain the capital gains that arise from being on the housing ladder. Uh, the capital gains, of course, accrue to the land, not the right. building that they occupy. But they, they have drilled into them almost daily the virtues of being what we call a free rider or a rent seeker. It's not that they want to cheat other people, so the language doesn't allow, uh, doesn't embarrass them with the idea that they are cheating, but that's what's happening. The people who are segregated into the low income neighborhoods, uh, the ethnic minorities in the States, for example, they're being cheated, but somebody's cheating them, but the link between me owning a home and them being deprived of full lives is not established in, in language that forces me as the homeowner to come to terms with the realities. And so uh, one of the aspects that I think may do uh, the job of forcing more people to come to terms with the implications is that in my view, and I spell this out in uh, book one of We Are Rent, we are heading for not just the end of the current business cycle, but what will turn into a catastrophic termination of, well, literally Western civilization. Now, critics might say that I'm just trying to scare people into accepting uh, the idea of a tax reform. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Uh, there is sufficient evidence to demonstrate that our civilization is heading for a precipice. And if we want to negotiate that precipice, because I don't think we can avoid it now, time-wise, but in order to negotiate our way over it on terms that enable us to get to the other side rather than going down the vortex, we have to make the changes that have long been advocated by the people who uh, subscribe to Henry George's original thesis. Now, uh, what will get that story out to the wider public? Well, it, in the end, it's on all of us as individuals to, to do our best to inform people. And you're doing the job and Henry George School in New York is also contributing to that. Uh, effort at alerting people to at least ask them to reflect on the evidence. And the, the evidence, of course, I, it's, it's incumbent on me to provide that evidence. So in book two, which, which should be out next month, I document the detail of the timetable in a forensic way. And I provide a countdown to the end of the current housing cycle in 2026 so that people could check the uh, thesis that I present on a year by year basis. If I'm wrong, I'll be delighted to be wrong because I don't want to see a catastrophe. But if I'm right, then we better get our skates on 
and uh, there can be no excuse for not effecting the kind of changes which the academic community acknowledges is correct, but which by and large, apart from people like Joseph Stiglitz, they're not willing to discuss uh, in any meaningful way. I can only sit in sort of exhaust, exhaustion for the amount of effort that we all have put into this attempt to educate the public. And as you say, we're continuing to do that as best we can, but we're almost like, you know, the, the voice in the wilderness crying out still. You know, even, with, even with all of the exposure we've had with regard to the internet and YouTube, the work that you've done on YouTube is tremendous. The videos that you've produced are hard hitting. They deal with the fundamental issues. Um, many of them get thousands of views. Uh, and yet the political machinery in the world seems to be moving in the wrong direction or either further from the right direction. It seemed as though when the Soviet Union fell, there was this sentiment that social democracy was going to spread. And yet now, perhaps because of the uh, reasons you've, you've explained in the book, the right has arisen and people out of fear or, or a sense of foreboding about the future seem to be embracing the ideological right. Um, and that seems to me to be the, the part of the great risk that you've described. Do you, would you agree with that assessment? Indeed I do. You will recall the book that I wrote called The Traumatized Society. Yes. Well, ours is a traumatized society. And it's because of that, that someone like uh, Trump could get elected as president of the United States. There we have the living tragedy of a man who create, helps to create the conditions of poverty in the richest country in the world is elected by the very people that his system, his culture exploits. And we can only understand that in terms of the masses being traumatized to the point where they fall for the con. He claimed to be the art of the de deal-making process. He was a deal-maker uh, indeed, but the deal was a rent-seeking deal. He could never expose it as such, and the commentators failed to draw the connection. But in book two, uh, chapter one begins with your erstwhile president, uh, Donald Trump, and I explain how he managed to calm 74 million people uh, late last year into seeking to get him re-elected. Well, I'm not pessimistic, Ed, for this reason. Certainly within the UK, we see many individuals and groups who are groping towards trying to revisualize the political system. Uh, they, they're talking about reforming democracy. Well, in book two, I draw a distinction between the democracy that we have today in the West and what I call authentic democracy. And all those groups throughout the UK will be invited to consider whether they are merely trying to redesign the old democratic system that will lead to the same results, whatever changes they may make to the way they vote or communicate, or whether they want something that resembles an authentic democracy. And of course, I define authentic democracy in terms of what I call in book one, the evolutionary blueprint. What made human beings possible? The thing that made human beings possible was their willingness to work to create a, a flow of net income, which could be invested in themselves as creatures coming out of nature, in their communities, in their minds, all of that was made possible only because they were willing to produce that extra flow of net income, rent, literally rent. And that's why I say, we are rent, we're the product of rent. And when people were enslaved in order to make the plantations work in America, they weren't just stolen out of Africa, 
what the slave owners were doing and trading in was humanity itself. And when we begin to redefine history in that kind of language, people would find it a lot more difficult to wriggle off the moral hook because we're all moral beings. That was part of what was in ingrained into us during the evolutionary uh, time period out of nature. We still have our moral faculties and we just have to enliven those faculties, remind people of the sentiments that made us human beings so that it would be more difficult for them to say, sorry, but I want to keep the capital gains on my home. Well, part of the story that you tell in the book is really uh, explaining that there was a time in history when communities were successful because the relations between people in those communities rewarded the production of wealth. And eventually every society, every society that's settled in one place needs rules for allocation of access to resources. But then we see throughout history that every group eventually succumbs to hierarchy and you have the appearance of what amounts to a class system with an, a, an aristocracy at the top aligned with the priestcraft and then everyone else working for them. Uh, in, in recent writings that I've attempted to explain what's going on, I, I say that, that most people who live in an urban environment today equate to sharecroppers because in the sharecropping system, you gave up a third or a half of what you produced every year to the non-producing landowner. Well, under the wage system that we live under now, many people are experiencing the same thing. If you're not a, if you do not own a residential property, I suspect this is as true in the UK as it is in the United States, your net worth at the end of your working years is nominal because in rent, you've paid out a high proportion of your earnings every year to the, the landlord that, own, that owns the property you live in. Uh, and it very much in my mind equates to sharecropping, same kind of arrangement. And that's the system that was embedded in the laws uh, of the colonies of America right at the beginning. The aristocracy who created the plantations in Carolina defined their constitution in terms of the power must be with those who own the land. So everybody else was outside the legal system and they were therefore uh, supplicants, subordinate to the people who owned the land. And that's why Joe Biden has to understand he will fail, as will Boris Johnson in this country. When they talk about building back better after the coronavirus pandemic, uh, they are being sincere in wanting to improve uh, the system, building back better, but they will fail because the essential legal structure is exactly the same as the one that was planted in America in the Carolinas in the 17th century. Nothing has changed. And that's why Biden's attempt at uh, overcoming racial prejudice in America cannot succeed. I mean, literally cannot succeed. And we're going to have to explain that to him and to Kamala Harris in detail so that at least they understand that they are hoodwinking people if they continue to try and sell the idea of eliminating racial prejudice while observing the economics that create this prejudice. Uh, so it's a big agenda, but uh, my heart sank when I heard Joe Biden say he would help to eliminate discrimination against black people because they were entitled to accumulate wealth through their homes. In other words, he was yeah. enshrining the very mechanism of discrimination into the center of his thinking. Of course, he doesn't understand this, but that's where he has to be told. So we have to find ways of reaching people who sincerely want to equalize people's life chances, but who don't know how to do it because they're locked into the old thinking. Well, the interesting thing about our current, our new president, Mr. Biden, 
is he's from the state of Delaware. And in his years in Delaware, he did have exposure to the communities of Arden that were founded based on Henry George's principles of sharing the rent, uh, but never really, I guess, never really had any real exposure to that, those principles or thought about them. So he's, he has the standard view of whatever his economics team is telling him needs to be done. And that's... Isn't, isn't Delaware also the state where corporations go to register for tax benefits? That's correct. Uh, it's it's a major uh, it's a major source of of corporate tax benefits. In fact, the last report that I saw a few years ago was all the revenue that the state raises. Uh, a quarter of that revenue comes from the fees that it gets and the taxes it imposes on the corporations that are registered there, but, but really do no effective business in Delaware. But it raises an enormous amount of revenue, which means that, for example, other taxes on the people in Delaware are relatively low by comparison to those in, in adjoining states like Pennsylvania and New Jersey. But, um, but perhaps our friends in Delaware can eventually reach uh, President Biden with, with the message that he has ignored, even though he's been next door to it, you know, most of his adult life. I, I just wonder, you've been recently interviewed by Carl Fitzgerald, and Australia seems to be a place where the potential for change is at least more likely than in many other countries that they, they have some recognition of the land problem there. Um, where do you see the best chances of a real structural systemic change occurring that will serve as a model for the rest of the world? Well, federal uh, land tax in Australia is interesting. It's already in action. Nobody can say it's difficult to impose a charge on the value of land because they need to click on the website of the New South Wales uh, Valuer General and see all the detail of how they do it today, levying a direct charge on the value of land. But uh, nonetheless, there are uh, huge barriers to turning that modest success into a systemic change. My uh, expectation, maybe it's just an aspiration, is that the change will probably come first in the United Kingdom for a variety of reasons. Twice in the past attempts were made to effect change through Westminster. So I'm wondering, third time lucky? Mm. The United Kingdom is fragmenting. Scotland wants to go independently and join, rejoin the European Union. So the constitutional crisis will force some deep reflection. How do we keep the union together again? What will it take? And my arguments will be presented in book two of We Are Rent. Uh, Scotland is, uh, to me, really interesting because they are seeking land reform but they don't understand it in terms of revising the revenue system of government. It's more a case of paying to buy some land off the big landowners and giving it to deprived communities. But nonetheless, they have an active public policy uh, project to effect land reform. So taking all the bits and pieces, my instinct is to think that we just might see the breakthrough in the United Kingdom not the least because in Scotland they have an election uh, in May of this year where the nationalists will uh, succeed and will demand to break up the kingdom. Uh, and then in four years time, both in the US and in the UK, there will be the elections for president over there and the U Westminster government over here. And at that point, we've got to uh, exploit the opportunities of public debate to shift the focus of attention onto a new plane. And if we fail to do that in 2024, we're in deep trouble. So uh, I choose to be optimistic, to think that, we, that, that the uh, tide of history is flowing in our favor, 
uh, and it's a matter of keeping up the hard work. Well, it certainly seems as though if any people should appreciate the depth of the land problem, it should be the people of the United Kingdom. You know, you're, the, the writing you've done about opening people's eyes to the real purpose of Magna Carta, uh, that was startling to me when I first read it, and then it made total sense, uh, a, a true understanding of history of what uh, the land barons in, in Britain were getting by getting uh, the king to sign the Magna Carta. Uh, that would seem to be a lesson that, that, that Britons would understand intuitively. Have, have you found that to be the case or uh, even are modern Brits less aware of the nation's history than I would give them credit for? Oh, uh, people have lost the knowledge of the past and that was intentional. It had to be so. In the 16th century, when the land tenure and the taxation system shifted in favor of private ownership of land in order to accumulate rents in uh, pub, uh, private pockets, they knew they had to change the mindset, the collective consciousness of the population, because it was an otherwise an impossible project to sustain. Well, over the course of five centuries, they succeeded by shifting the public debate, the language that we use, the laws and the institutions. So all of that and, and the understanding of what went on in history, all of that uh, con contributes to this uh, damaged uh, mindset that we now have, the trauma that prevents us from exercising our freedoms to do what is right. Uh, and that's why the national conversation, which I say now needs to take place, must begin with uh, re-examining the words that we use, the common everyday words, leading to the kind of catharsis that uh, eliminates the trauma that traps us in a way of living that creates the discrimination, the inequality, uh, low incomes, the exploitation, all of which is pushing our societies towards this precipice that I'm fearing at the end of this decade. And yeah, Britain has a major responsibility to lead the way because we, that is our country, uh, planted this model of exploitation throughout the world in the, in North America, in the Antipodes, we have a special responsibility. And the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, is, is one way of awakening consciousness. But there are many other attempts now being made to elevate people's understanding. And we just have to participate in all those strands in order to help people to focus on the particulars that will really deliver what they want. For instance, uh, we have uh, people in Britain who think that we need to introduce compassion into politics. There can be no compassion without a change in the revenue system. And until they understand that, they will continue to call for compassion from their politicians who will end up delivering the palliative policies that won't change anything. And we have to explain why. It seems to me that right now, the major um, proposal to soften the effects of the system has to come from, is coming from the monetary theorists. It's coming from the folks who think we can simply uh, create money out of thin air so long as we allow government to spend it into circulation. Um, will, I mean, certainly the United States has done that to a degree that no one would have imagined, you know, uh, 10 years ago, the amount of, of increased spending by government. And we have this huge public debt, if you put public debt in quotes, because the money's created out of nothing. Um, but there is this tremendous pressure to keep pouring money into the system and into the hands of people because the regular normal economy isn't providing the income for people to even have a 
subsistence living. How long can this go on, do you think? Well, it can't go on beyond the end of this decade. Uh, but it's really interesting. Yes, you're right. It's called mo modern monetary theory. They've clothed it in fancy terminology, but it's going back to Keynes and uh, the argument that not, there's nothing to stop uh, a nation that owns its own currency to just bankroll any projects, providing it doesn't cause inflation. Well, when you stand back and look at it, it's a symptom of the alienation of the social system. People are taking these flights of fantasy because they're able to do so because spending money is disconnected from the revenue system. We don't uh, have a system that links obligations with personal rights. Uh, so people say, well, it's up to the government to overcome such and such a problem. Nobody wants to talk about who will pay for it. Do I have to pay for it if I want it? Well, of course you do. If you want it, you should pay. Oh, well, no, we don't have that because to talk in terms of uh, linking rights and obligations is to question the rights of some people to the revenue flow which they're receiving. Where are the obligations on landowners? There aren't any. It, theirs is a culture of irresponsibility. It's merely a system for extracting the revenue out of the domain uh, of the people who work for their living. So we can't have rights and responsibilities. And so we have to substitute uh, into that uh, fantasy world ideas like keeping the government going by creating money out of thin air. Uh, and uh, I'll be addressing that issue as well in book two of We Are Rent. I think another problem that faces us today is there is a predominant uh, conviction that we live in a world of scarcity, that, that um, it translates into anti-immigration. Uh, we don't want more people coming into our country to compete with us who are here for jobs, for housing. And so it seems as, as though to me that we've moved away from assimilation of new people into our societies. As Henry George would argue, every person comes with, with two hands, a brain, and is able to produce if they're permitted to pr produce. But we have this sense of uh, it's a zero sum game, I think, and it's causing a lot of, of uh, social disruption. And certainly Black Lives Matter is one part of that in the United States. And from watching the news in other countries, there are there's a great deal of animosity raised on the part of the dominant uh, ethnic groups against minorities. And that seems to be spreading. Uh, how, how, you know, how prominent is that in the UK or? Well, not so much because uh, we don't have as many immigrants of color uh, as you do in the United States. But what, but you're, you're uh, uh, flagging up the very issues that enable Donald Trump to exploit people into voting for him. And, but this is a history that goes back at least to the Civil War. Immediately after, with the emancipation of black people, so began the fear for the low-income whites that you refer to, who then formed the Ku Klux Klan. The National Rifle Association is created, uh, restrictions on voting rights. All of the issues, uh, housing legislation, to uh, segregate the, the blacks from the whites. All of that over the last 150 years is designed to keep the system functioning, which is otherwise an unsustainable one. Because so many people are uh, discriminated against, that includes white people as well as black people, the system has to have a mechanism for maintaining itself while continuing to allow the exploitation to continue. And so whites who feel vulnerable in the Rust Belt towns are told that their jobs are at risk. And it, that might be because 
uh, of attempts by Joe Biden to em uh, uh, emancipate uh, the black neighborhoods. And so the whites will get even more defensive and uh, you will get the crazy people uh, coming to the fore. And that serves Donald Trump's uh, agenda completely. He's a rent seeker. He wants to preserve the system. So he exploits it. And that will continue until we expose it for what it is. It's a, a crime against humanity. And on top of all that, there's the class structure that exists that's based on wealth and accumulation of wealth. Um, on, I mean, we have, we have this um, fear of others. And then we also have a separate class system that, you know, in the United States, it's always been denied that we have a class system, but it's more, the evidence is there, you know, every year it's greater and greater that there's these class distinctions even though our politicians might campaign without wearing a tie or a, or a thousand dollar suit. Uh, you know, it's still very much a class system and, and in our political system is dominated by lawyers. Um, I, I, well, and look, uh, the class system originated uh, in the UK where the nobility decided that they didn't want to recognize obligations in return for holding land. So they start dispossessing the people from the commons, the peasants, and they create the class structure. So class is based on land and the economics of rent. And in the, U in the USA, they may not want to call it that, but the reality comes back to that very fact. Most people's wealth is located in land, whether it, it, they are big rent seekers like uh, the people collecting the rents of the spectrum hold up in Silicon Valley or small homeowners in their neighborhoods in the Midwestern towns. The wealth comes from the rent. And of course that's a class structure, even if they choose not to call it such. I don't remember if it's, it's from one of your books that I recall this, but it was about, uh, it was a comment I read somewhere uh, that made perfect sense in terms of the rationale. And that was the argument for aristocracy in, in Britain was that um, if individuals had to work for a living, they would then have, uh, they would be less inclined to, to be able to serve as legislators in the public interest because they would have, they would be working and so they would be part of the working classes and so they were, their, their ability to be objective about public affairs and to concentrate their energies on the affairs of state would be diminished. So I thought that was a very interesting argument that we, we were better off having people in, our, in the House of Commons who do not have to work for a living. Well, it's one of the rationalizations of an indefensible system. We have to have all the myths, such as the one you just uh, recounted, because otherwise, why would we tolerate handing over our rents to those who don't actually work for them? Uh, and so people's minds are closed to the reality by the sorts of narrative that uh, you've just recounted. And it's those myths that we have to expose. And I hope I do my fair share of that. Uh, exposing uh, in uh, We Are Rent. Um, if I fail, then, well, it'll be for the next generation to keep trying. Well, the work will be there, as you've said before. Uh, and I feel the same way about the work that I've done and that others have done and that the work that the Henry George School was doing today, um, reaching a larger and larger audience all the time and making the effort to make these fundamental principles known, get people thinking about them. And hopefully uh, our message will come through all of the noise that exists out there. I mean, it's, it's one, one of the great benefits of the internet is that you and I can have this conversation from across the, across the pond and, and we can reach a large audience, but we're competing right at this moment with Millions of other people who are doing very much the same thing, trying to get their particular message out to people. And somehow, somehow we have to find a way for our message to rise above this. Um, do, you, do you have any, um, 
insight into whether or not you'll be your your trilogy will become recognized by the media and, and you'll have an opportunity to be interviewed uh, by any of the media in the UK? I'm, uh, I decided to serialize the book uh, in the hope that those who are already acquainted with the uh, nature of the economics can begin to read into uh, what I'm presenting as a new narrative for those economics. Uh, so I decided to publish three three books instead of one, but the, the single volume will come uh, at the end of this year, probably. And it's at that point that I want to go to the media to with review copies and so on to invite them to come to terms with the, the essence of what I'm saying, which is, yes, what has hitherto been called a land value tax is fair and it's efficient, but we need to broaden the debate in terms of the moral obligation of each individual to reassess that system in a holistic way, rather than in the fragmented approach to thinking about issues that we have today. It's only when looking at the big picture, the total outcome of the way we live, that we'll begin to see that it just is not sustainable. And if I've made the case for the argument that we're coming towards the end of what is a 200 year period of decline, the idea of the end of Western civilization was floated 100 years ago by an author who said, but it takes 200 years to get to the end point. The end point is now, if the thesis is correct, if all the evidence supports the idea that we are at a point of collapse, that politicians are suffering from paralysis of their policies, that the productivity levels have now slumped to the point where they can't go any lower, uh, that the conflicts within our societies between the haves and the haves nots is, is an existential threat to the communities that we live in, then people might say, okay, now we have to have the big reset. And I'm hoping that conversation will begin at the end of this year. Well, I, uh, I will be doing everything I can to alert people to the, the trilogy. Um, uh, this, is, this is, again, it's a real difficult challenge, even within our community uh, of, of people who have been attracted to Henry George's ideas to embrace the approach that you're taking above the incremental approach of trying to get some gains accomplished at the local level, particularly here in the United States. Um, the Australians are working on, you know, on that as well. And there are small groups uh, in other countries, as you are probably, I, I think you're aware of for sure, that there's been a minor advance in Germany you know, all of which has been based on incrementally trying to get people to understand that they're raising revenue the wrong way. Um, so your message, I, I guess, part of our interview, reason for our interview is so that our own colleagues scattered around the world can fully understand what you're trying to accomplish with the trilogy. And even if they don't feel compelled to redirect their own energies, at least embrace the larger vision that you have and acknowledge that it has extreme importance. Well, uh, we, we need to look at the evidence. We've got a hundred years worth of evidence that shows that the uh, reforms at the municipal level do not deliver. They don't deliver anything that is going to change anything by way of reducing racial prejudice, uh, raising productivity, turning the society into a sustainable one. Uh, and yet the original promise from Henry George is that it would change the system, that, that the uh, full implementation uh, would uh, deliver the, kind, the quality of life that we're all entitled to. So the, those of us who concentrated on the low level partial steps it might have seemed reasonable approach at first through despair 
but by now the, the evidence is in it goes nowhere so time for a reset and that's what i'm arguing for another aspect of the challenge seems to be that every movement that's that progresses seems to have a, charism a charismatic leader who gains public attention whether that charismatic leader is saying the right things being truthful or not it seems that we're still as as human beings we're attracted to these charismatic personalities uh, and you know we we succumb to whatever their message is if they seem to have this this personality um, how do we overcome the, the cult of personality with a real sincere well, search by individuals for understanding of how the world really works. There's no point in denying that uh, people like charismatic leaders, but there are people, let me cite one of them, Kamala Harris. I regard her as a potential uh, charismatic leader not just for the United States, but the Western world, if she could hook into an understanding of why she will fail over the next four years to do anything to improve the quality of the lives of African Americans and Latinos in America, she might just go into the presidential campaign where she is seeking to be president with our message. That's just one example. I happen to wonder whether it's going to be a female that produces that charisma that could make the difference, not just in America, but in other countries. Look at New Zealand. They have a female uh, prime minister, a wonderful lady. She doesn't have our message, but if she did, well, that would be wonderful. Germany's been led by a woman, a uh, powerful personality. If she came to understand just how much more content Germany would be, with uh, an amended fiscal system, uh, she could probably push it through. So we have to look at the personalities of future leaders and try and help those that might do the trick. I guess I should send uh, Kamala Harris uh, a, a copy of We Are Rent with an accompanying letter to hopefully get her to read it and, and perhaps reach out. Uh, well, not are, a bad idea. I, I have, I, many of us have, have great respect for her and uh, for, for the kind of intellect that she brings to the position. And I, I have to give, you know, President Biden a lot of credit from that standpoint of bringing new people into the Democratic Party and, the, and his administration who may be more receptive to, to coming up with, with policy ideas that are outside of the traditional box that they've been framed in for so many decades. Uh, but as you say, it's up to us, those of us who have the understanding to do what we can to get these people to begin to, to think that there's some other, other solution. And when you mentioned Joe Stiglitz, you know, here again, here's the one economist in the United States who has at least the media um, attention. But even, even his ideas are, his insights are still not part of the mainstream. 90, 99% of the economists, if you interview them about uh, the main causes of our, of our boom to bust cycle and, and the problems of the free rider or rent seeking, or as you say, cheating, um, how many of them would even know or have read Joseph Stiglitz, let alone Mace's books or, or the writings of Michael Hudson even. Um, there's still a, an entrenched hierarchy, it seems to me, in economic thinking that is really difficult to get beyond. And maybe the, the answer has to be that we have to get to, um, you know, the younger generation who realize that, that conventional economic theory has really uh, caused a lot of problems in terms of wrong-headed policies. True, true. And so, for instance, the young lady poet who uh, was invited to read her poem 
uh, at Biden's inauguration. There's a young uh, black female uh, person who approached correctly just might end up uh, exercising the kind of uh, charismatic uh, influence uh, that uh, is needed. How about in the political arena? Uh, where where are you finding the most receptive, uh, you know, people to to the basic message that you're delivering? Is it is it uh, the labor labor party? Is it the conservative party? The Greens or independents who? who uh, there are uh, are bound by traditional you know party politics. Well. There are people in all uh, ideologies who are on the fringes with this particular idea. So that there are conservatives who support the idea of what is called a land value tax. Uh, there are right wing think tanks like the Institute of Economic Affairs that support the policy because it's located in Adam Smith's original book. And then there are uh, the liberals and, and labor certainly the Green Party is the only one that, that formalizes the proposal in a major way in their manifesto. But those individuals are the uh, entries into those parties. And somehow they have to be uh, animated into coming together. We need a coalition of people who are capable of leading a mass movement uh, non-party political uh, of the kind that arrests attention. And that's one of the things that over here in the UK will be, it, it, we are already giving serious thought to how we can construct. And um, the opportunities will arise in the United States for the same reasons. But, but in the end, there is this need for a new narrative, not the one that enables people to say, oh, that's Henry George, 19th century, isn't it? Well, he's history. Well, the issues aren't history and we need the narrative that speaks to the contemporary problems. Is there anything that should be written in book form or in articles that is not being written by uh, your, your colleagues in the Georges community around the world? What would you recommend that those of us who are writing articles, uh, trying to get published, uh, should concentrate our efforts on that are not being contributed to today? Well, you really uh, asked a provocative question, Ed. Uh, we shouldn't, con oh, let me limit my answers to the following. We shouldn't limit ourselves to economics, which is what in the main we've done in the past and that was been one of my failings we need to go back to the beginning look at all the disciplines the whole of human history and uh, address the issues that come out of that rich diversity of knowledge and scholarship uh, but bringing it back all the time to this focus on the need to recreate a sustainable human system I call it a social galaxy uh, uh, and resist the temptation to rely just on the model of the natural world, which is what so many people are now doing. They think that we can draw on the principles of nature to recreate uh, the way of living in the social galaxy. Well, yes, nature is beautiful. Its laws are exquisite. But humans emerged out of that world by constructing parallel rules, parallel laws. And that's what we have to focus on. So the writers uh, who advocate the kind of economics that uh, we think is at the core of uh, the issue of the future need to embellish their writings with the world's their oyster. Somehow we have to get the the um, social sciences to come back to an interdisciplinary view of how human beings interact with one another and with the world. 
Um, it goes back to what Adam Smith and the political economists were trying to do. I keep emphasizing to students in the classroom that Adam Smith wasn't an economist. He was a moral philosopher. And, and he had a, a very specific understanding of how human beings relate to one another that economists have seemed to have lost in their quest to develop a discipline that is heavily dependent upon mathematics and equations and coming up with um, solutions to problems that exist in the world they've created, but may not reflect the world that actually exists. Well, there are people seeking to extend their uh, uh, knowledge and, uh, and the interdisciplinary approach. Um, but I'm afraid it comes back to my original point. We need to frame those exercises in a narrative that locates the awareness of what is central to the human project. Uh, and that's why I feel that I may be onto something important with the notion of we are rent. Uh, I wait for the critiques to show that I'm wrong. And I'll finish up our discussion with just a question to you about uh, whether or not uh, once you've finished the three books and they're, they're in the public domain, if they're out in the public, do you plan to do any more uh, documentary videos to highlight the arguments that were in the book? I'd like to see you on YouTube uh, more and more frequently. Uh, most definitely, that's my intention uh, because that's one of the important ways of communicating today. And uh, I'm certainly geared up to doing exactly that. Well, Fred, uh, as always, it's a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, you're one of the, the, the most productive people I've known in my life, and, you're, you're, and I applaud your, your constant attempt to rethink you know, uh, the, the origins of our current conditions and come up with ways that will help us get out from under. Uh, I certainly have found uh, uh, the book We Are Rent extremely uh, challenging and thought-provoking, and I hope that a growing audience of people finds it similarly. Let's Let keep working on it, and thank you so much, Fred, for taking the time to be with us. Thank you, Ed. That's it for this edition of Smart Talk. For more information on this and other episodes, please visit our website, henrygeorgeschool.org. I'm Edward Dodson, and thank you for listening to Smart Talk.